Welcome to Charmy's Bookcase, where I, Charmy Terrell, review and discuss books I've read. This video is my in-depth review of Sarah J. Mass's book, A Court of Thorns and Roses. It is the first book of a series of five. Though this book was one of my favorites of 2022, I did have some problems with it. This series is a first for me when it comes to reading about fairies. I'm a witch and vampire type of girl, and when I think of fairies, Wings Club and Tinkerbell come to mind. Not big, muscular men with their big... You know, this is what has become a staple around the series. But what I really like the most about this series is the world building around it. I love that there are different lands, lesser and higher fae types, and the powers explored in these stories are really fun to read about. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This video is filled with spoilers. So if you plan on reading the book and don't want to know what happens, I advise you stop watching now. Without further ado, let's get into it. This story follows a 19-year-old girl named Feyre living in the human lands of Peruthian. Farah is a lot of things. She is a hunter, a provider, and illiterate. Yes, illiterate. Which is funny because this book is supposed to be a Beauty and the Beast retelling, except Belle can't read. But Farah can paint, which is what she does when she's not providing for her family with her hunting skills and doing everything else for her family, which is the thing I didn't like about this book, the family dynamic. Since their fall from riches due to their dad's bad business deals, Farah lives in a small one-room shed with her two sisters and her father. The mother is dead by this point and is really connecting with the Disney theme here. Even if she was alive, she probably wouldn't be any help. And I quote, My mother, imperious and cold with her children, joyous and dazzling among the peerage who frequented our former estate, doting on my father, the one person whom she truly loved and respected, but she also had truly loved parties. So much so that she didn't have time to do anything with me. Yes, the terrible mother trope. The only reason Farrah doesn't just leave and let her family fend for themselves is because on her mother's deathbed, her mother made her promise to look after each other and to stay together. So Farrah continues to provide for her family, waiting for the day for her sisters to get married off so it would be just her, her father, and her painting tools. Her older sister Nesta is written off as the mean sister, always yelling and nagging at her and calling her names. Elaine, the middle child, has her head in the clouds most of the time. It wasn't that Elaine was cruel. She wasn't like Nesta, who had been born with a sneer on her face. Elaine sometimes just didn't grasp things. It wasn't meanness that kept her from offering to help. It simply never occurred to her that she might be capable of getting her hands dirty. And speaking as a middle child, I can agree that we're often forgotten, and I can admit I forgot about Elaine throughout this entire book. And then there's Farah, the youngest. Their father, who isn't really given a name and is only referred to as father, he reminds me of those grandparents who laid in bed all day in the Willy Wonka film. Like, get your ass up and work. The family dynamic is so bad and I don't know why. I thought I was reading a Beauty and the Beast retelling, not Cinderella. One day, out on one of her hunts, Farah goes into the woods. She's about to kill a deer when a wolf comes into view, an abnormally huge wolf, and she kills the wolf instead. There is a moment when she hesitates when killing the wolf for a fear they might be a fairy. Long ago, in this world, fairies ruled over humans. They were their subjects and slaves till the humans rebelled. Pause that. Why do fairies have slaves? What can humans do that fairies can't? Are slaves just there to be tortured, to be puppets of, for their amusement? Like they can literally snap their fingers and anything they want appears to them. So I don't see the use for human slaves. But I don't know. Anyway. A war broke out, which by the life of me, I don't know how the Fae lost it. Like, they had the power, they probably had the numbers, and yet they still lost. But whatever. But a treaty was made to end the war, and a wall was set to separate the humans from the Fae. Which didn't mean shit when one came busting into their home one night. Like, why even have a wall if there's cracks in it? The Fae can come in whenever they want to. The Fae was a beast, not in terms of strength, but from his physical appearance. The beast had to be as large as a horse, and while his body was somewhat feline, his head was distinctly wolfish. I didn't know what to make of the curled elk-like horns that protruded from his head. But lion or hound or elk, there was no doubting the damage his black dagger-like claws and yellow fangs could inflict. I do give Farah props. When the beast came in all rough and wild, she held her ground. Even scared shitless, she didn't cower. The wolf she killed was in fact not a wolf, but Fay. And for killing the Fae, the treaty states that she must either die or live in the Fae lands for the rest of her life. A life for a life. With the other option being death, 
Farah agrees to live in the Fey Lands, thinking she'll be able to escape. The Fey Lands of Peruthian are cut up into seven courts. Night Court, Day Court, Dawn Court, Winter Court, Summer Court, Autumn Court, and Spring Court. With each court having its own high lord that ruled over the land. Now I would admit, this is when the story started to slow down. And many people probably didn't like it, but I didn't mind. I was wrapped in the description of this fantasy world. Like a baby in a warm blanket, I was comfortable reading about the history of Ruthian and the different holidays and events they held. I love the way Spring Court is written, and if it weren't for my allergies, I would stay there. On the contrary, Farrah wanted nothing more but to leave, which I understand. The Fae are deemed as evil and vile creatures, and one did just kidnap her from her home. So escape would have been on my mind at all times as well, but I would have played it more sly than her. Let them lean into the perception that I was on their side, play nice and all, before tricking them and escaping. Unlike Farah, who was standoffish and spent most of the time trying to escape the Beast, also known as Tamlin, who is the High Lord of Spring Court, and his friend Lucian, Lucian, Lulu, whatever, his foxy friend. And I did say fox, not because of his foxy personality, but because he has a fox mask permanently glued to his face. All the fairies in the Supreme Court have to, including Tamlin, as well as a maid named Alice, who is the black friend in every 90s films. Not quite Dion status, though. A curse was placed on Tamlin's land he calls the Blight. No, not that Blight from DVD. This Blight is more like a plague that is weakening their magic and requires them to wear a mask the entire time. Even though Tamlin is a high lord, his people aren't protected from the evil creatures that roam his lands. And with dark creatures roaming, trauma bonding occurs. Which happens when the big bad bogey comes to town and Tamlin kills it. He gets injured in the process and Farah bandages him up. It's a sweet scene until Farah gets offended and storms off. To me, Farah gets offended very easily throughout this book. Then Farah is attacked by a group of Nagas. All because she had to go out to find a fae called the Surreal. They are a species of fae who are bound to answer truthfully any question asked of them. She was told and warned not to do this, but she does it anyway. She risked her life just for the Surreal to tell her to stop trying to run away. Stay with the High Lord, the Surreal tells her, just before they are attacked by a group of Nagas. She kills a few with her amazing hunting skills, and Tamlin wipes out the rest in his beastly fashion. And after this, their relationship improves immensely. As for the mask, I was like, that's it? This is not that bad. It could have been way worse. These masks hide the tops of their faces. Imagine having to wear a mask from that Twilight episode. That would have been hell. But just having the top part of the face missing isn't really that bad. I'm guessing it was just to go along with the Beauty and the Beast retelling where Belle can't see his true face until the end. Though with the mask on, she can still tell that Tamlin is a heartthrob. So what harm did the mask really do? Then comes Fire Knight, and Tamlin specifically tells Farah to stay in her room. But does she listen? No. She goes out and is almost killed by a group of Fae when a mysteriously new man is introduced into her life, Resand. He comes in like the night, all erotic and dripping as sex, and I'm like, why? I already know that Farah will leave Tamlin for Resand by all the stuff I see online. But so far, I like Tamlin way more than Resand. What can I say? The reserved, socially awkward, fiddle-playing, dirty poem-writing beast pulled on my heartstrings. I love the line, your hair looks clean. It literally made me smile. And after that, there's a celebration where Farrah gets drunk and dances with Tamlin while he plays his fiddle, which is just a poor man's way of saying violin. It was a real heartfelt moment. It was so cute. But it's all ruined when Resan's bitch ass shows up the next day. He shows up with nothing better to do but to mock Tamlin. He's literally giving, I'm bored so I'm going to mess with my siblings vibe. And then he discovers Farah. He uses his powers over her, which I guess is mental powers. Against my own volition, my body straightened, every muscle going taut, my bones straining. Magic, but deeper than that, power that seized everything inside me and took control. Even my blood flowed where he willed it. I couldn't move. An invisible talon tipped hand scraped against my mind. And I knew one push, one swipe of those mental claws and who I was would cease to exist. He's like a twisted Professor X, I guess. Tamlin tells Risa not to tell Amarantha about Farah, and that's when shit starts to get real. Amarantha is the one responsible for the curse. 
Resan demands Farah to give him her name. Instead, she says her name is Claire Bedor, another girl in her village. As soon as she said Claire's name, I knew Claire was dead. <laughs> like, it was so obvious she was gonna die. Out of fear for her safety, Tamlin sends Farah back to the human lands, but not before they sleep together. Then there's this awkward moment where Tamlin says he loves Farah and she doesn't say it back, and it's hilarious. Back in the human lands, Farah sees how her family is thriving under Tamlin's influence. They have a big house and money, and no one seems to remember the beast that took Farah. Well, except Nesta. I don't really understand why Nesta was able to fight off his influence. It just says, I had never heard of glamour not working, but Nesta's mind was so entirely her own. She had put up such strong walls of steel and iron and ash wood that even a high lord's magic couldn't pierce them. It seems to me the only reason Nesta wasn't affected by the glamour was to be motivation for Farrah to return to Tamlin. There's a moment when Nesta isn't being a bitch and convinces Farrah to return to the Fey Lands to protect Tamlin. So Farrah goes back and runs into Alice, who gives her the 411 on Peruthian's bitch high lord, high queen, whatever, Amarantha. Her story is legend among our kind, legend and nightmare. She was the king of Highburn's most lethal general. She fought on the front lines, slaughtering humans and any high fae and fairies who dared defend them. But she had a younger sister, Clithia, who fought at her side as vicious and wrenched as she. And so Clithia fell in love with a mortal warrior, Jurian. Jurian commanded mighty human armies, but Clithia still secretly sought him out, still loved him with an unrelenting madness. She was too blind to realize that Jurian was using her for her information about Amarantha's forces. Amarantha suspected, but could not persuade Clithia to leave him and could not bring herself to kill him not when it would cause her sister such pain. Jurian betrayed Clithia after months of stomaching being her lover. He got the information he needed, then tortured and butchered her, crucifying her with an ash wood so that she couldn't move while he did it. He left pieces of her for Amarantha to find. Amarantha has hated humans with a rage you cannot imagine. The truth is revealed. Tamlin lied about the treaty. Farah didn't need to live with him in the Feylands for killing one of his own. He needed her to break the curse Amarantha placed on him for insulting her sister. The curse is very convoluted with many requirements, <laughs> and I quote, If he wanted to break her curse, he need only find a human girl willing to marry him, but not any girl, a human with ice in her heart, with hatred for our kind, a human girl willing to kill a fairy. Worse, the fairy she killed had to be one of his men, sent across the wall by him like lambs to slaughter. The girl could only be brought back here to be courted if she killed one of his men in an unprovoked attack. Killed him for the hatred alone, just as Jurian had done to Clithia, so he could understand her sister's pain. Like damn, Amarantha should have been a lawyer. No one would have gotten out of her contracts. Farrah goes to a place called Under the Mountain, where Amarantha rules. Once there, she is captured in like five seconds. She ain't really skilled at sneaking yet. And is brought to Amarantha immediately. Another thing. I may be wrong, but why didn't Farrah just say she loved Tamlin when she was brought to Amarantha immediately? He was standing right next to her. If all he needed was for her to say, I love you, why didn't she just say it right then? Were the 50 years up? Anyway, we find Claire's body a few feet away, burnt to a crisp. Also, Amarantha keeps the eye of the human male who betrayed her sister and killed her. It moves around as in forever torment, so you know, she has issues. And like every stupid villain, instead of killing Farrah outright, she decides to play a little game with her because she's bored. Like seriously? Not only that, she says that if Farrah figures out a riddle, she can forego the three tasks and the whole thing will end right then. There are those who seek me a lifetime, but we never meet, and those I kiss but who trample me beneath ungrateful feet. At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft-handed and sweet, but scorn I become a difficult beast to defeat. For though each of my strikes lends a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out this riddle. All you really had to do was pay attention to the story. It was the one thing Tamlin needed Farrah to say, love. And Farrah and her infinite wisdom couldn't get it on her first try. 
Literally every other person in that room got it but her. If I was Amparantha, Farrah would not have last five minutes. I would be like Amanda from the Saw series. Oh, you think that if you get the key and unlock yourself in time, you'll go free? Psych, I rigged it so no matter what you do, you're dead. Oh, you think ripping all the hooks out will set you free? Which is nearly impossible. Like, how was he supposed to rip that out of his fucking jaw without dying? I don't know. But if you did, the door is welded shut, so nope, dead. That's the kind of shit I would do. You wouldn't want me as a villain. I'm merciless. The first task is a huge worm that she kills with the bone fragments of its victims. Easy, right? Piece of cake. But she is beaten in the fight and is literally dying when Rhi San comes to see her. And instead of healing her out of the goodness of his heart, he twists her arm that's already injured to get her to strike a deal with him. Fuck you, Rhi San. Another thing I didn't like was there was a month in between each task. I feel like one month was sufficient. Three months is a very long time. Not only that, Farrah was made to entertain the Fae guest every night. Rhysan turned Farrah into his little puppet, making her drink wine so she would forget things and making her dance with him. Even when she said no, he forces her to drink anyway. I just can't with him. The second task involved Lucian. Farrah had to decide between three lovers and if she chose the wrong one, spikes from the ceiling would come down and kill them both. Too bad the only way for her to know the right one was to read the riddle on the wall. I bet those writing lessons Tamlin offered would have helped. She ends up passing because Resan helps her out. When she picks the wrong lever, Resan makes her feel pain until she picks the right one and feels nothing. After the second test, she is back in her cell for another month. There is a moment when Farrah is crying and Resan comes and licks her tears away. And I'm like, ew, that's disgusting. She got all his slobber on her face, ew. The final task was for Ferris to stab three fate innocents with an ash dagger, killing them. I was expecting the three fate to be people she knew, like Alice and Lucian, but no, there were two randoms and the last one was Tamlin. Then she has this moment that only lasts a few minutes in real life, but reading it felt like five years. She realizes that Tamlin's heart is made of stone. Yeah, back in the early scenes of the book, Lucian mentions Tamlin has a heart of stone that us, the readers, were supposed to remember. I did not. So when she stabbed him, it didn't kill him, but it did wound him badly. At that moment, Amarantha started to do what she should have done from the fucking beginning and began to kill Farah. Reeson jumps in and attacks Amarantha, but she tosses him around like a beanbag and goes back in on Farah. And with Farah's last dying breath, she answers the riddle. Love. It's love. Before her spine cracks. As Farah is dying, Tamlin destroys Amarantha and gets the other Fey lords to bring her back to life with their magic. With sugar and spice and everything fey, Farrah returns to us as a member of the new high fey, all bright and shiny. Yay! The Wicked Witch is dead. Dorothy's alright, and everyone who survived is hopefully not permanently scarred. Right? <laughs> Reeson says his goodbyes to Farrah, and as he's about to leave, I quote, He bowed at the waist, those wings vanishing entirely, and had begun to fade into the nearest shadow when he went rigid. His eyes locked on mine, wide and wild, and his nostrils flared. Shock, pure shock flashed across his features at whatever he saw on my face, and he stumbled back, actually stumbled. What is, I began. He disappeared, simply disappeared, not a shadow in sight, into the crisp air. Well, they're mates. I fucking knew it. Ugh, whatever. It's fine, I guess. It's okay. I just hate the whole mate trope shit, you know? Anyway, it ends with Tamlin and Farrah skipping into the sunset, with the final words being, Let's go home, I said, and took his hand. The end. Shit, that was a lot. There were so many things I didn't get to say because the script was getting way too long. Overall, I rate this book a 4 out of 5. I really enjoyed it, even though I had some problems with it. I will be reviewing the whole series. Don't forget to subscribe for more. There wasn't much spice in this book, but by all other accounts, the books get way more spicier. So... I'll see you guys next time. Bye.